1943, train cars rolled out of Cincinnati stacked with drums, stenciled Proctor and Gamble glycerin. Not laundry soap, not candles, glycerin. The ingredient that you nitrate to get nitroglycerin. Today, we're gonna talk about how a soap company became part of America's munitions supply chain. In peacetime, glycerin is a humble ingredient in soaps and cosmetics. In wartime, you nitrate it and you're halfway to nitroglycerin, the energetic core of propellants and explosives. It's the same molecule, just a very, very different mood. I'm Mandatory Fun Day, you're watching Haywire History, and this is the soap company that likes to turn war criminals into a pink mist. Before they were the backbone of America's World War II munitions supply chain, Procter & Gamble began in 1837 in Cincinnati, built on fats and oils chemistry. By the late 1800s, the firm had a national profile thanks to ivory, which was trademarked in 1879, the bar that famously floats. The important part of that story isn't the jingle, it's the industrial base behind it. p and centralized production and R&D at Ivorydale, an integrated complex where labs and manufacturing sat side by side. That structure let them tweak processes, measure yields, and scale lines with unusual speed for that era. Here's the subtle chemical hinge. When you make soap from fats or oils, you split triglycerides. You don't just get soap, you also get glycerin as a co-product. Even in the 19th century, P&G was recovering and purifying that stream. Nobody was thinking future propellant feedstock in 1890, but the capability was there. A lesser known pre-war move sharpened the chemistry bench. In 1933, P&G launched a draft, an early synthetic detergent. It wasn't yet the heavy duty juggernaut Tide would become in 1946, but it signaled a shift from soap maker to company that solves cleaning with industrial chemistry. That mindset mattered when the government later needed very specific molecules at scale and they needed it fast. P&G didn't just scale factories, it scaled demand with something new, daytime radio serials. On August 14, 1933, a 15 minute drama prepared on Cincinnati's WLW, Oxydol's own Ma Perkins. It jumped to NBC that December and ran for decades. The sponsor was literally in the title. That's why we still call them soap operas. No way. They didn't stop at one show. Sponsorships touched programs like Vic and Sade, where ad copy folded into everyday banter. Crisco at the kitchen, Ivory at the sink. The result wasn't just awareness, it was habit formation. When millions of households buy on a stable cadence, you can run huge fats and oil plants near capacity. And when you run near capacity, all output streams stabilize, including co-product glycerin. Demand planning met mass chemistry and the pipeline got predictable long before anybody said mobilization. That's the hidden link between a radio cliffhanger and a wartime production curve, a reliable audience enables a reliable plant. Let's connect the molecules. In soap, making fats and oils are broken down by saponification with alkali or by hydrolysis. You end up with fatty acids and glycerin. Crude glycerin contains water and salts and needs purification, distillation, bleaching, polishing before it can serve in food, pharma, or defense. For explosives and propellants, the magic step is nitration, carefully introducing nitric and sulfuric acid so glycerin converts to nitroglycerin. Nitro isn't the only energetic in town, but it's a classic backbone for double base propellants and for blasting gels. The point is simple. If you can make, purify, and ship glycerin at scale, you're already halfway to providing the feedstock the War Department needs. This is why a soap company mattered when war loomed. The chemistry matched the problem. Once the U.S. mobilized, an unusual public campaign appeared. Save your fats. Posters and radio spots asked households to pour used kitchen grease into cans, bring it to butchers, who acted as collection notes. Those fats were split and refined into glycerin, which then flowed to nitration plants and propellant lines. Viewed coldly, it's a distributed raw materials program that reaches into every kitchen in America. Viewed humanly, it's a daily ritual. Make breakfast, save the bacon grease, help a factory, make something a soldier needs. The key detail for this story is where those fats went. To processors who already knew how to handle fats and recover glycerin at scale. Companies like P&G didn't need to invent a new pathway. They needed to increase throughput, tighten specs, and keep rail cars moving. And there's literal photo evidence. In 1943, federal photographers captured rows of P&G drums marked glycerin in Cincinnati. It's the clearest snapshot of the moment when domestic chemistry became national defense logistics. This is America! 
where breakfast, butchers, and ballistics all meet on a bill of lading. From feedstocks to finished shells, the Procter & Gamble Defense Corporation? The Army's problem wasn't just making ingredients. It was loading, assembling, and packing live munitions safely and fast. That work requires disciplined processes, QA culture, and the ability to train thousands of workers into precise roles. Skills civilian giants already had. So the government tapped firms like P&G to operate ordnance plants under contract, and P&G formed the Procter and Gamble Defense Corporation for the job. At the Wolf Creek Ordnance Plant near Milan, Tennessee, P&G Defense served as the operating contractor on the load assemble pack side. Adjacent to the government-run Milan Ordnance Depot, think of it as a dual-track hub, civilian-run production lines next to military storage and distribution. The Gulf Ordnance Plant opened in 1942 under P&G management. At peak, it employed 10,000 workers, many of them women, loading everything from 20mm and 40mm rounds to 75mm shells and 100-pound bombs, plus naval tracer ammunition. Buildings were deliberately spaced and earth-bermed to contain blasts. Floors, phones, tools, everything was specified to suppress spark. The civilian skill PNG brought wasn't pyrotechnics, it was process control, materials handling, and packaging powders at scale, hour after hour, without mistakes. The headline is not that a soap company made bombs, it's that a mass production company ran high-risk lines safely and hit the numbers. Don't go anywhere because the video is not over, but I want to tell you about the mandatoryfunday.com, which is where you can support me further. All my gear is fulfilled by Ranger Up, which is a veteran-founded, long-running, and rock-solid on quality company. They've been serving the military community for years, and it is once again veteran-owned. We brought it back, we relaunched it. Go check it out, the link is on my website. People are stealing my designs. You can see my designs all over the place on the internet. The only place to get my official merchandise is through one of the links on my website. This month's designs are the Department of Offense, and this meeting could have been a fist fight I really thought you guys would like that. There's a members area on my website, and in the members only section, there's an exclusive store where you can get 20% off and a bunch of other benefits. There's You get 20% off both apparel and non-apparel. In addition to that, my website members are voting on different aspects of a classic car that I am restoring. I will be selecting one of the members who participates in these votes to fly out and have dinner with me in the car. There are rules and stipulations, obviously, but you know, that's the long and short of it. And finally, my website is where you can see all the partners I'm working with. The American Legion does veteran advocacy and community support. It is the biggest and oldest veteran service organization on the planet, and I am so happy to be working with them. I will be a member for life, even, even if I'm not working with them at some point. Transcend is a veteran operated and owned telehealth company. They do comprehensive health. They will help you dial in your physical fitness and performance in any way that you might need. I started using them about two months ago. I immediately saw the effects. I feel so much better. They've helped me completely change my life and I have so much more energy now. Click the link if you want to check them out. Let's get back to the story. PNG already ran the fats and oil splits that created glycerin and already had purification capability. Wartime demand didn't require a brand new invention. It required rerouting and scaling existing streams to tighter specs. Systems fit national brands live on forecastable demand, process discipline, and QA. Those same muscles translate to ammo loading where tolerances aren't just cost issues, they're safety issues. Schedules, line balancing, inspection regimes, documentation. This was a familiar muscle memory for a company that had been packaging powders and liquids for decades. Marketing became throughput insurance. The 1930s radio strategy made purchases habitual. Habit made factory cadence predictable. Predictable cadence meant confidence to run at capacity, which meant a steady river of co-products like glycerin. When Washington called, P&G didn't scramble to build a river, it already had one, and it could open the gates. At plants like Gulf Ordnance, thousands of workers, many women, were trained into specialized roles. Seating fuses, weighing charges, sealing, labeling, packing. Training wasn't a nice to have. It was the weapon that kept the lines both fast and safe. P&G's contributions here looks a lot like corporate muscle memory. Clear procedures, step-by-step -step checklists, shadowing to competence, and a paper trail for every lot. Communities reorganized around shift bell. Bus routes synchronized with start times. Dorms went up for out of state hires. On-site clinics and cafeterias reduced friction so workers could maintain focus. It's the same logistics DNA you see in civilian consumer goods networks repurposed for ordnance. And the skills stuck. After the war, those workers carried process discipline and safety culture into peacetime jobs. That is an undertold part of the home front legacy. 
Let's circle back to radio because it's more than branding color. Oxidol's own Ma Perkins wasn't a six week campaign. It was a decades long habit machine with the sponsor in the title. The show taught an entire country that buying Oxidol and later other PNG products was simply part of daily life. Programs like Vic and Sade wrapped a ad copy in character banter. Why does that belong in an industrial story? Because it stabilized the front end of the supply chain. When households buy predictably, plants can run predictably. When plants can run predictably, co-product glycerin flows predictably. And when the government needs a feedstock for nitroglycerin, there's less ramp up pain. Magic, got it. An advertising decision in 1933 echoes into a war decision in 1943. By late 1945, demobilization shifted the map. Government facilities like Milan continued under army control with rotating operators, while P&G stepped back from ordnance operations and recentered on consumer products and chemicals. The glycerin know-how persisted for peacetime uses, food, pharma, personal care, and the company's research culture pointed forward. In 1946, P&G launched Tide, the first heavy-duty synthetic detergent that would reset home laundry worldwide. That isn't an explosive story, but it is a through line, a company that learned to think in process streams and molecule performance kept doing exactly that, just pointed at laundry instead of logistics for war. The wartime lesson remains elegant in its simplicity. The fastest wins under pressure often come from repurposing systems you already run. If you liked this video, check out some of my other history videos or some of my geopolitics videos. Really just watch any video. If you haven't subscribed to me, why? I feel like we're friends at this point. You can get 10% from the VA for listening to my voice this long. I am Mandatory Fun Day, that was Haywire History, and you know a little bit more about soap now.